Good afternoon. Hope you guys have enjoyed the day. Uh, I got to catch a little bit here at the end and it seemed like a pretty exciting uh, agenda. So uh, I know I, uh, I'm the last uh, presentation of the day, so I'll try to keep things uh, on schedule so you can get on with your evening. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Peter DeSantis. Uh, I am, uh, I lead our global infrastructure, AWS infrastructure teams and our AWS support teams. I've been with uh, Amazon for 20 years and with AWS since we originally launched EC2. Uh, so they asked me to come and talk a little bit about innovation and, and some of the things going on with AWS and uh, that was pretty exciting. It was also pretty exciting that it was just across the lake. So uh, I got to get out here. Uh, you know, I, I find when I talk about innovation, I often end up talking about scale. Uh, innovation at AWS starts with the customer, but it often ends up being uh, aided by the scale that we're at. When you have large scale, you can make disproportionately large investments in things that you wouldn't be able to invest in at smaller scale. And so uh, it's really the, the scale of AWS that's allowed us to do some pretty innovative things, and I wanna give you a little peek uh, at some of that stuff tonight, uh, or this afternoon, but first I wanna start with an overview of uh, AWS's global infrastructure and the scale uh, that we have. So as I said, I was with AWS uh, since we originally launched EC2, and I can say it always seemed like things were big and growing fast, but uh, sometimes it helps to put things in perspective. Uh, so uh, showing up here on the screen is what AWS looked like uh, five years after we launched S3 and EC2. And as you can see, uh, after that first five years, we had uh, four regions uh, in the world. Uh, our original region in the East Coast, of the US, we added a second US region on the west coast uh, of the US. We added our first EU region in Ireland uh, and our first Asia Pacific region uh, in Singapore. So that was the sum total of the first five years and uh, I'll tell you it was no easy task to get those uh, four regions launched. Uh, in the subsequent five years, uh, we launched seven regions, and I won't uh, detail all of them, but you can see that we uh, have a region in San Paulo, we've added a bunch of uh, uh, regions in North America, we added an additional region in Frankfurt in the EU, we added our first region in China and Japan, and uh, a region in Sydney. Uh, and so over the second five years, uh, we went from four to 11 regions. Now if we look at just uh, the regions that we've launched, since 2016, or we've pre-announced that we will launch uh, either later this year or very early, very early next year, that's an additional 11 regions. So in that three-year period, uh, we've essentially doubled the number of, of regions. And uh, again, I won't bore you with uh, all the regions here, um, but you can see them on the map. You can see quite a few new European regions, quite a few uh, new North American regions, Asian regions, India, uh, and uh, Bahrain in the Middle East has been pre-announced. And so it, that just gives you a sense of how things are accelerating with scale. And so obviously one of the ways we're scaling is, is scaling out this network of data centers. And, and truly this is one of the value propositions that people uh, get very excited about when they think about AWS. It's, it's this ability to write an application one time and deploy it anywhere in the world. And it, so all of those regions uh, look and act the same from the customer's perspective. And so this means that you can write your application once and, and literally deploy it anywhere. Um, and so let me get into a little bit of what a region is. So it, it seems like that's a lot of dots on the map, but when you really drill in, uh, each of those dots is a, a pretty substantial uh, full-scale infrastructure deployment of and to itself. So when we talk about a region, uh, we, we really talk about a set of availability zones. And an availability zone is a really important concept for us. Uh, an availability zone is, is a fully isolated partition of our infrastructure. And it's, it's really the core building block that we ourselves use when building services and that we expose to our customers for them to write their highly available services on top of AWS. And so it, the, the availability zone is sort of the core, uh, the core unit of deployment for us. And, and an availability zone it isn't just a single data center. Uh, it can be uh, multiple data centers. It, it, you can think of it as uh, kind of on the scale of hundreds of thousands of servers in, in one of these availability zones. Uh, they're isolated from other availability zones by distance, usually significant distances. You can think in terms of miles. They're engineered on their own power infrastructure. They're meant to be fully independent of the other availability zones in the region. 
as you can see, the, the, the diagram there is showing that it's not a single data center, but rather several data centers can be connected via uh, what we'd call metro fiber, and, and this, these connected data centers can be treated as one logical uh, availability zone within, within a larger region. So now, how do we assemble a region? Well, we take multiple availability zones, and today, uh, the vast majority of our regions have three or more publicly uh, visible availability zones. And this is actually something that we learned. Uh, originally, we had a, smaller regions had fewer publicly available uh, availability zones. And what the feedback we got from customers was, hey, I really, I really appreciate the idea of being able to write to availability zones, and I want that construct available everywhere. And so one of the things we've done over the last several years is we've launched avail uh, three publicly availability zones in all of our uh, regions. So those availability zones then get connected via uh, metro fiber to one another. And so each of those availability zones is connected to each other availability zone through fully redundant, fully isolated metro fiber. And so you can imagine there's quite a bit of fiber uh, in the grounds in any one of these given regions. Now, you have to connect those regions to the internet. And so each of these regions has two transit centers, and those transit centers are fully independent and peered with lots and lots of networks. And then those, in turn, are connected back to each of the availability zones through fully redundant, isolated fiber. And so it, that gives you a concept of what a region looks like. Now, of course, we have to connect all these regions together. And so uh, here I again have the map of the publicly launched regions that we have. I just added the 119 cloud front uh, points of presence that we have. Now, our, our CloudFront points of presence are really uh, full CloudFront pops, but they're also places where our networks peer with public, uh, other transit networks and, and eyeball networks. And so you can think of all those places as peering points across the world, and we connect those with a dense mesh of fiber, our backbone, uh, which uh, each of those is one or more 100 gig links. Uh, we've actually done quite a bit. I talked about scale and the innovation that comes with scale. We've actually done quite a bit of innovation uh, just on this backbone network. For example, we operate some of the densest fiber cables uh, in the world today on some of those links. And so the, obviously uh, fiber is kind of constrained by the size of the conduit or the number of trenches you have between any two points. And so the ability to pack more and more fibers into a given uh, location is, is a cost advantage and something we've spent a bunch of time uh, optimizing in order to get that backbone to be as high scale and low cost as possible. And then uh, just to round off the, the global infrastructure, we have something called Direct Connect. Direct Connect is really a whole new set of sites where customers can directly connect to our network. And so now, e either via fiber that we provide or that third parties provide, customers connect their data centers to our data centers. So I won't fill in the whole mesh there, but you can imagine this is quite a connected network. Okay, so let me change gears. Massive scale, and I said I was gonna talk about some innovation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drill in on compute. And so compute uh, for us is, there's lots of types of compute. There's serverless compute, there's containers, and then our classic compute offering uh, is EC2, and EC2 provides instances. And so uh, the EC2 instance uh, is kind of our fundamental unit of server full compute. And it itself uh, has existed for now over 12 years, and it has actually evolved continuously over that 12 years, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of that evolution as well as some of the uh, reasons for that evolution. So let me start with the goals that we had when we thought about the EC2 instance. The EC2 instance really, uh, first and foremost, uh, has to provide great security. Uh, we host our customers' workloads on those EC2 instances, and the EC2 instances uh, provide, the, the software that hosts the EC2 instances provides the security uh, that protects both the EC2 compute environment and the customer workload. And so first and foremost, just like everything with AWS, uh, it has to provide great security. Secondly, it's gotta provide great performance, and performance can mean lots of things when it comes to an EC2 instance. It can mean network performance, it can mean storage performance, uh, it can mean CPU performance, it can mean absolute performance, it can mean performance deviation or, or jitter. Um, so uh, ultimately, uh, the better we can get at providing high performance at low cost and, and consistent high performance at low cost, uh, the better the customer's experience. And then finally, we want familiarity. We wanted an EC2 instance, and we still want an EC2 instance, to uh, look just like any server in the whole world. We, we don't wanna have to put constraints on the customer's workload. We want the EC2 instance to look and feel like any other server. 
Okay, so here's a quick picture of what the EC2 instance looked like when we launched 12 years ago. Uh, actually, it was probably more like 10 years ago. I don't think we had uh, EBS uh, 12 years ago. So uh, what you can see up here is uh, kind of a logical diagram. Customers' workloads are running on the top, and where I say customer instances. Then you have uh, the hypervisor, which separates those instances from one another and from uh, the underlying server hardware. And then you've got a set of modules, essentially. You can think of these as microservices that run underneath the hypervisor that provide critical services. And so um, you can think of these like uh, things like the network process, the packet processing pipeline. This is the thing that uh, takes uh, customer uh, packets and filters them and uh, applies things like security group rules that, that uh, inform what packets are allowed to be delivered where. Um, the storage layer, which uh, does the same thing for things like remote storage, uh, EBS in our case. Uh, and then, then a set of modules that do things like uh, uh, monitoring and management for, for the instance. So essentially a whole bunch of uh, little microservices that ultimately cooperate together to provide uh, what is the EC2 instance. So this is the original uh, EC2 architecture. And uh, I started talking about this about six months ago at reInvent, but we've been really on this path to move to what we call the Nitro uh, system architecture. And this is kind of our, uh, really, our second generation of, of EC2 instance, but it's, it's really, uh, I don't like to talk about generations. The, the cloud is constantly evolving. We're, we're constantly improving and uh, uh, upgrading parts of our system as we learn and as we achieve scale and as we can make investments. And, and those investments have been playing out over, over many years. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of the history, as well as some of the exciting stuff that's happened as recently as last week. So. Uh, again, the Nitro Systems architecture is a fairly simple concept. Uh, rather than having all of those modules that are running uh, underneath the hypervisor run on the same server as the customer's workload, we want to move those uh, modules to dedicated custom hardware uh, where we can better control for performance and security and uh, a bunch of the other things that uh, I mentioned us wanting to, to optimize for. And so. So we started this, uh, as I said, a while ago. Um, the first thing we did, uh, our first generation uh, Nitro instance was actually uh, what we called the C3 instance, which was launched at reInvent in 2013. And it basically moved all of the network processing from the classic EC2 instance and main system hardware to the Nitro system. And as a result, we saw 20% additional network bandwidth, 50% uh, latency improvements, and, and most importantly, probably for our customers at the time, significantly reduced variability. So by having a dedicated uh, resource that was handling all the network traffic for each and every instance in our fleet, we were able to put very strong guarantees on uh, the latency of handling each and every packet, which meant that uh, applications that had very tight requirements on network latency or network performance uh, saw a significant upgrade with the C3 instance. Um, so the story goes on with the C4 instance, and with the C4 instance, we targeted offloading storage. And so again, we took that microservice that was running on the EC2 host in the EC2 software, and we moved it to the Nitro subsystem. And again, uh, as a result, uh, we were able to validate encrypt and route storage requests much more efficiently with better performance, less variability. This one launched uh, in 2014, exactly uh, one year after uh, the, uh, the C3 instance. Um, we, we provided something, uh, we used to have a, a, a modality for an instance called uh, EBS optimized. If you wanted really, really good EBS performance from your EC2 instance, you could tell us to optimize it. Once we completed this move of the storage uh, component to the Nitro system, all instances became EBS optimized and in fact per per performed better than what we had previously called EBS optimized. So that's sort of, unless you've been using uh, EC2 for a long period of time, you might not even know that that option existed, uh, nor should you. We also were able, as a result of moving that, uh, that service off of the main hardware, we were able to return more of the resources on the host to the EC2 instance. And so in this case, we were able to improve the performance of the C4 instance by 12.5% over, over the previous generation just a year before. And that was because we were able to take that load off of uh, the primary processors and system and put it onto the Nitro system. So this is where the story gets kind of interesting because uh, up until this point, we had been able to 
build our Nitro system from a bunch of, uh, we, we built custom hardware from a bunch of commodity components. And so we were able to find a bunch of uh, processing components that we were able to assemble and, and offload uh, the, these, uh, these functions that I've talked about. As we looked ahead, uh, we knew that to get all of the rest of the components, all of the critical uh, hardware, all of the critical security functions, um, we weren't gonna be able to necessarily find those components off the shelf. And so we had a decision to make at this point. Uh, the first one was to stay the course and to try to continue to assemble and possibly uh, you know, find some innovative parts and uh, put together a Nitro system uh, that would allow us to move the remainder of the functionality. The second uh, was to use what's called an FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. Uh, these are kind of uh, reprogrammable uh, chips that allow you to uh, specify something uh, that looks a lot like uh, a silicon implementation, um, but doesn't quite perform as well as raw silicon, but the, the beauty of an FPGA is it can be reprogrammed and, and customized, and so I'm a very big fan of FPGAs, but for this particular use case where we were talking about having one in every EC2 instance, uh, it didn't provide quite the uh, cost or performance point that we were looking for. So then the third option we had was to actually go and invest in building our own custom ASIC. And indeed, that was the direction that we decided to go. Uh, it turned out uh, for the second generation, the C4 instance, we had been working with a startup company called Annapurna. Uh, they, had been, they had provided a uh, ASIC that uh, wasn't really designed specifically for what we were doing, but had a lot of functionality on it that, that worked really well for our, our C4 instance. Um, and as part of that uh, engagement with that company, we learned a lot about what they were doing, a lot about the team, and uh, ultimately, it turned out that uh, they had a very interesting vision that aligned very closely with ours. And as a result, uh, we decided to acquire the Annapurna uh, t uh, company back in 2015 and, and ultimately set them on the vision of building uh, th this custom silicon for us. So that brings me to reInvent this year where we announced the C5 instance. Um, the C5 was the first instance to fully offload the EC2 uh, 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 software to the Nitro system. Uh, it was also uh, it was also used a, a custom developed set of functionality on an Annapurna uh, ASIC, and it also used a uh, brand new custom hypervisor, which I won't get into uh, this afternoon. But in total, uh, this provided sort of the culmination of of this vision of moving all of our EC2 software onto this dedicated specialized hardware. Uh, and indeed, we got a few benefits from this. One is uh, we, we were able to give to the customer nearly 100% of the system resources. And so an EC2 instance truly did become indistinguishable from any server you can buy. So we could really spec out any server and we wouldn't have to apply any of those resources towards managing the workloads on EC2, but we could return all of those resources to the customer workloads. And also, uh, through some innovative things we've done, which I won't have time to get into this afternoon, allows us to provide significantly increased security uh, for, for EC2 instances and for the EC2 uh, environment. One of the more exciting things, and we announced uh, the i3 bare metal instance, uh, which is our um, SSD, high performance SSD instance at reInvent. One of the more uh, uh, exciting things that the full Nitro Vision enabled was the ability to uh, give to the customer a, an actual bare metal instance. And so uh, we were able to give with uh, bare metal instances an instance which has no hypervisor at all. And so the, the customer can install whatever OS or hypervisor they want directly on the hardware. And again, all of our system, all of our security and processing is running on the Nitro system. So there's no security issues with that. So the, what this means is that for customers who have workloads which cannot be virtualized, or for customers that require a specific uh, hypervisor, or customers who have customer hostile licensing terms for their applications, they can actually have raw access to hardware and they no longer have to deal with the, uh, the, virtualiz the virtualized EC2 instance. So the vast majority of customers don't choose to run the vast majority of their workloads on bare metal, but for, the, for a small subset of your uh, applications, it, it could have a profound difference on your cost or your performance, or just make it possible. 
Uh, and then last week, uh, we extended uh, the Nitro subsystem with support for local NVMe drives. And so we launched the C5D and the M5D, uh, which are uh, sort of transformatively different local storage for EC2 instances. And so what I mean by that is uh, the performance uh, is several orders of magnitude better than local storage that we've been able to provide. Uh, and it's, it's truly uh, exciting performance. And it's, it's very, very close to what you'd consider bare metal uh, NVMe uh, SSD performance. And so for a certain class, class of applications, uh, this is uh, very exciting. And again, completely enabled by the Nitro subsystem, which allows us to, to provide these services uh, entirely uh, offloaded from, from the core EC2 instance. So I'll pretty much wrap up here, but I'll say this, is, this journey's not over. So we, you know, we started uh, after, uh, the, you see a picture on the board, the, the Annapurna processors that we have uh, produced uh, since, well, the, the first processor, the first generation was the one that I said that we used uh, previous to the acquisition. Uh, 2016 was the first uh, co-developed uh, processor, and this, this in fact underpinned uh, the C5 instance that I just spoke about. And then the, this year, uh, starting in reInvent, we got samples and we are bringing into production our third generation, which will enable uh, even more exciting functionality uh, for our customers. Um, but again, uh, just to kind of put a, put a bow on this, it really this level of investment, this ability to, to go all the way to putting uh, your, your uh, infrastructure into custom designed ASICs is, uh, has truly allowed us to take a bunch of customer requirements that excite us and invest in really large efforts uh, to deliver this value. And so this, this flywheel that, that happens when you, when you have a lot of customers asking for a lot of things and a lot of scale uh, to uh, justify really big uh, investments is, is super exciting to us. And uh, so with that, Thank you, and I think we might have some time for a chat. Hey, Tom. Have a seat. Good to see you again. See you. So with these custom chips, what are you really allowing people to do? Like what, what workloads are specifically being used in some of these areas, and, and how has that evolved since you started designing your own chips? Yeah, well, so the, the, the chips primarily we're talking about right here have, uh, they've really just gotten EC2 out of the customer's way. And so what I mean by that is all that software we used to have to run uh, that used to potentially interfere with the customer's workload because it was running on the same processor, using the same memory, now is totally offloaded from the server. And so what it means is that it's uh, easy for us to provide instances that uh, are, look just like bare metal to our customers. And so the, the the exciting part of what I've talked about here and what we've done initially isn't so much the new functionality it provides, but the fact that it totally uh, isolates the, I think what we used to call the virtualization tax or the, the overhead. Um, but can you give us an example, a specific, you know, not necessarily the brand, but like a, t a type of customer who is using these specific custom design chips and what it's allowing them to do with their applications? Yeah, uh, well, so I, I guess one of, the one of the things I'm excited about, uh, we actually provide, uh, in addition to the, the hardware work that we do, we've also provided uh, a set of EC2 instance types uh, that, that provide customers with access to things like FPGAs. And so uh, the, our F1 instance, which we launched uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, actually allows customers to, to have a fully functional GP, uh, uh, FPGA instance uh, program the FPGA and then run any application they want. And, and in fact, there's actually a marketplace of third-party providers uh, who have written uh, uh, essentially code for those FPGAs. And so as a consumer, you can, you can if you have a developer who knows to, how to program an FPGA, you can write your own FPGAs. Or if you just have a problem you want, say you want to do a genomics uh, sort or you want to do a Monte Carlo simulation, and the F, you, can, you can basically use this library of third-party uh, um, codes and, and spin up a large number of EC2 instances running with these FPGAs. And so that, there's been a lot of exciting customer activity in that space, but I'd say you know, one of the industries or, or verticals that has that truly been excited about this is, is the genomic space. So there, there's a couple of um, uh, third-party uh, products available on EC2 that allow people to do things like sequence genomes faster than you can do on even um, extremely specialized hardware. Uh, you can do gene searches. Um, so that space has, has um, there's a lot of excitement 
But, but again, it, it's, it's programming custom hardware, and so the, the biggest challenge for customers is do they have the expertise uh, to do that? And, and so the idea of having this marketplace uh, is really exciting to us where, where uh, some of the very smart people that know how to program these things can, can find uh, customers with these problems and, and create these interesting accelerations. So at a higher level, um, how are workloads evolving across your customer base that will require new different types of custom silicon? Like, you know, I, I know that AI is probably used a lot and there's, um, genomics is a, yeah, oil and gas exploration is one I hear a lot. What are the next wave of those types of applications that will, you'll need to develop more and different custom silicon for? Yeah, so this is one of the things that we're really excited about, uh, and, and FPGAs are a part of the story, but only, only a part of it. Uh, as, as the cloud uh, becomes the new normal, uh, it, it's, uh, it's really enabling customers to, to use a much broader variety of, of hardware and, and, and services. And so in a traditional data center, uh, you might have had two or three server choices from, from your local IT department. In the cloud today, you have uh, literally 15 uh, different types of instances, and, and some of them are optimized for storage, and some of them are optimized uh, for m machine learning. Uh, for example, our, our P3 instance uh, with, with NVIDIA Volta. You, so you've, uh, you've got these FPGA instances, and I, we see this um, variety increasing over time. And so as workloads are coming online, um, or, uh, or as we're building services, uh, we're identifying opportunities to accelerate those workloads, to make those workloads uh, cheaper, faster, um, and, and we're, we're able to use both our own experience as well as the requirements that customers are, are telling us about to, to design more, more, uh, more instance types. And unlike a traditional data center, um, that's no longer a burden on each and every uh, data center uh, provider. Uh, the cloud allows access to, to many, many, many different uh, varieties. And so I would say the general trend uh, that I, I see happening over the next several years is, um, you know, I think there'll be more innovative hardware development. And, and whether it's uh, uh, AWS doing that uh, innovation and, and providing it to customers, which, which I am certainly will, or whether it's third parties uh, producing uh, very targeted um, uh, hardware uh, for specific problems and then making it available via the cloud, I think you're going to see more innovation on the hardware side than we've seen for a while where, you know, really for quite a period of time, you know, if you kind of think back 20, 30 years, there was a lot of different processors and a lot of different, and then everything got kind of homogenous because that was beneficial and it was the easiest way to deliver it to hundreds of data centers. And now the cloud kind of flips it back on the head and says, well, actually, you can, you can have a lot of different uh, options and, and it's not that much more work. And so I think we're going to see more uh, as, as more, and, you know, machine learning, as you said, is a great example of this. And machine learning workloads are still early days. Like we're still, you know, I, uh, I think there's uh, still a lot of, uh, evolution that's going to happen in machine learning, and I think there's an opportunity to learn from from what the scientists are doing and what the, uh, com the computer scientists are doing, and, and but to, to bring those disciplines together as well as hardware engineering and find some really interesting solutions. And, and so it's interesting how you said you sort of there's the centralization, you know, of, of you know, kind of chip design, and, and that made a lot of sense for reasons at the time. And you know, maybe we're seeing more of a, a re, you know, expansion of the possibilities that are available there. Um, how does that change the way you think about acquiring chips and servers? Um, you've got a custom silicon division. I'm not totally sure they can handle necessarily all of the evolving needs you'll have in the future. Um, how do you, so how are you thinking about that part of it? You mentioned third parties. Yeah. I, you know, I'd say one of the things uh, that's very exciting is uh, the, the silicon industry as a whole has gone through kind of a wave of consolidation over the last several years. But Along with that consolidation, there's there's actually a large uh, a large amount of startup activity, and so there's some really uh, you know we're, we're keeping a close eye on that. We're working with a bunch of interesting startups about how they might be able to bring those those technologies to AWS, and so you know we'll, we'll continue to want to provide you know one of our one of our premises is uh, we we want to we want customers to be able to do everything they want to do in AWS, and so finding uh, you know I think we'll do some very innovative things, uh, but but I think there's an ecosystem of really smart. Uh, startups up there also innovating in the hardware space on a, on a lot of different problems, machine learning being being one of them. And I, I think that um, you know the cloud is a great distribution model. If you think about it, if you were a if you were a hardware startup ten years ago, you had to go. Uh, it, 
you know, maybe you could convince uh, a big distributor to, to start to there package weren't up hardware your, startups. I what's mean, that? There weren't a lot yeah, of hardware startups because yeah. the distribution model was too hard. And so I think the the cloud actually changes that. I mean, the, the ability to uh, you know work with a few big players and and make your uh, specialized hardware available to millions of customers is is transformative for that industry as well. So I think we'll see more startup activity as well. So outside of chips, you know, you're someone who's seen a lot of. Uh, change in, in computing infrastructure and, you know, across the chips, networking, memory, all these different types of things that we've been talking about. Um, so, but like outside of the chip area, what evolving area of hardware excites you the most in terms of the possibilities it might bring? Outside of chips. Outside of chips. Uh, uh, I mean, it's really, it's really storage chips and networks are, are kind of the three big ingredients, right? And that, that hasn't changed in, in 20 years. I think all three of those areas, uh, um, are still, uh, you know, we keep thinking we're gonna hit walls on, on all of them, and, and uh, I, I don't see that wall coming in the short term. Like, I think there's still, uh, there's a lot of- For storage uh, and networking. Yeah, for storage and networking yeah. as well. I think we're, we're still seeing, uh, we're still seeing the, the sort of uh, rapidly accelerating speeds and feeds on the network, speeds and feeds on storage. There's obviously uh, some very interesting uh, new storage technologies that are kind of emerging between what we traditionally think of as RAM and what we traditionally think of as SSDs. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that, um, that, that we're still, we're still going to see that sort of trend continue in all three areas. And, and as I said, I think the one that's going to accelerate, though, is, is compute, because traditionally the compute has been standardized because it's too hard to have lots of variety in your data center. Um, you know, it always may, you know, if you think about SSDs and, uh, uh, SSDs and hard drives, you know, you know, folks got pretty good at at having both, because that certain workloads worked really well on spinning disks and certain workloads. So there wasn't 10 different variants in there. But compute really can be specialized uh, for, for workloads. It just didn't make sense when you had to install servers and manage servers and manage fleets of each. And, and by the way, some of those things require pretty sophisticated custom water cooling and, and different uh, management. And so it's no simple, simple task. So, but, but I think we'll see all three continue to move quickly. So. Okay. Well, with that, I believe we're, uh, we're out of time. So, right. Peter, thank you very much. Absolutely. Tom, thanks. <laughs>